right? And so, yeah, you should feel a little kind of butterfly-ish, right? And, uh, and that's a little healthy. I want to start off this particular lesson telling you a little bit about the tables outside. I appreciate the opportunity to set up a table for Kayo Publications. Uh, some of you saw the books that are out there. That is the nonprofit company that Aaron and I founded, I guess now 10 years ago, 11 years ago, something along those lines. Uh, and we produce resources to bless families. That's our mission. We believe that if the church is going to get stronger, the home has to get stronger. And so we want to help, help equip the home with resources. And the great thing about that is that there's a lot of spillover in those books that can be utilized in Bible classes for teenagers, uh, for ladies, maybe ladies groups, uh, even some things out there that men could benefit from. We've got deep level Bible studies, if you like going deep into the Word uh, from a Greek standpoint or looking at uh, Bible keywording, things along those lines. So I want to draw your attention to that table. But the table I really want to draw your attention to, especially the young people, is the table for Freed Hardeman University. Uh, I don't know what your intent is when you graduate high school. Some of you are going to go into the workforce. Some of you may go into college. Um, I'm just here to say, if you're going to go to college, then I would love for Christian education to at least be something that you consider. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me, and the only reason I say this because it gives you a little indication of why I believe in Christian education. My, my first degree that I got in college was from a, a secular school, Middle Tennessee State University. I have a degree in science, and I started off at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, and while I was there, they taught me, they actually brought in four professional evolutionists to teach me in my science classes why you and I were not created by an almighty God, but we just became, after a big boom and ooze, stood up into what you see today. Now, I will tell you this, at 18, you would think, well, you're Joe, you know, you knew better. At 18, I had to sit down, and I'm grateful I did with my grandmother, because I asked her a lot of questions. And I said, is it possible that God used all of that that they were saying to create this? And she was fortunate enough to have the answers. You know, in the book of Genesis, when it says that He created them after their kind, that doesn't mean that a, a, a fish grew into a, a, a reptile, which then grew eventually into a monkey, which grew into a Neanderthal, which grew into a human. That's not what the text allows. But I, at 18, was not ready to defend my faith. I went on and still continued to pursue a degree in science, but I was grateful to have people walk with me. I can tell you this, at Middle Tennessee State University, when I transferred my sophomore year, the teachers didn't care how my walk with the Lord was. They didn't care if uh, you know, there were girls being snuck onto the guy's dorm in the guy's dorm. They didn't care if there were all the immoralities that you would imagine going on in a public university. They didn't care. Because they weren't there for that. They were there so you could take your Scantron and you could take a test and then you got a grade and then you graduated. They wanted their money. I then went on to a school of preaching and I went to the Nashville School of Preaching where uh, I was blessed to meet Erin. She was going through the ladies' side of that and I had that opportunity and then I went on to get a degree from Freed Hardeman University, a master's degree. Now, the reason I tell you that is to say this there is a big difference. In all three of those forms of education. But the biggest difference that I want you to think about today is this. There's a big difference between going to a public university and going to a Christian university. Because at Freed Hardeman, I can tell you this, your class sizes are smaller. We're somewhere around 13 to 15 students per teacher in classrooms. Your student body population is smaller, less than 24,000 on campus. You have five social clubs, which are co-ed, so you still get to do the fun things amongst, you know, what you would think that would happen. But the neat thing about those social clubs are that you're going to have service projects, you're going to have devotionals, you're going to have time to grow spiritually with other young people your age in that unique environment. You're going to have opportunity to go to chapel every day, opportunity to go on mission trips, opportunity to study abroad. If you want to study in Europe, Fried Hardman offers that. But it's all the umbrella of a, a university affiliated with the church. Over 80% of our student body population are either members of the church or affiliated with the church. There is no other Christian university that says they're affiliated with the churches of Christ that have those numbers. 
And a lot of that is because our sports programs, we do have sports programs. We're NAIA. We have basketball, baseball, softball, golf, track, uh, our distance running. Uh, however, those programs do very well at Freed Hardeman and NAIA, but those sports are not the center focus of Freed Hardeman, which to me is telling you a good thing. Now, I, here's the deal. I have the privilege of recruiting for the Bible department, and I'm not going to pretend that everybody in this room wants to be a Bible major. But I will offer you this. There is, at private Christian universities, one of the things that we always get is, well, how am I going to afford it? How am I going to afford it, right? Well, here's the deal. Nobody pays full price at Freed Hardeman. There are merit scholarships that are given. There are trustee scholarships, honor scholarships. We have numerous scholarships for very diverse reasons. But within the Bible department, we have been very blessed to have donors. And so at Freed Hardeman, if you chose to come there, you can double major in one thing, get a degree in Bible as well, and you qualify for the Bible scholarships. So if you're interested in talking more about it, I don't want to take much time, but I do have a table up out there. And here's what I'm going to ask, especially if you're in high school, right? I have these inquiry cards back there, and I would love for you to fill one of these out, not committing yourself to anything, but what it does do is it says that Freed Hardeman might be an option for you in the future. Not that it is, it might be. And what's going to happen is they're going to send you an email from time to time to say, here's what's going on on campus. Uh, you're obviously going to be made known to the recruiter for California. Um, and which, by the way, is it still Lenora? Lenora Williams, which her husband Carrie works with Wayne with the Tahoe family encampment. So Miss Lenora knows California uh, and is very uh, well able to answer your questions that you might have. Uh, but here's the deal. In exchange for you filling out one of these cards and giving it to me, I have some shirts back there that I can give you. Okay, So I will ask you this. If you've taken one of these, without giving me one of these, then I need to exchange that. I need a refund on that deal, okay? If you took one of these and you're like, oh, I can't tell him now because I have one of his shirts, I'm not mad at you. I'm just going to say, why don't you go fill one of these out, leave it on my table, and here's what you say. Well, I already got mine, Mr. Joe. That's all you got to say, okay? Because you didn't know. But the high school kids especially, I want you to fill one of these out. Christian education needs to at least be an option. It doesn't have to be where you go, but it needs to be an option. So I'm going to ask you to consider that, and I appreciate Matthew letting me do that before this particular lesson. So, all right, now we're still going to stick on schedule. I'm just going to be flying quick. You remember I told you you have to listen fast? Well, you're going to be listening really fast on this one, okay? All right, let's go to our Father in prayer, and then we're going to jump right into this third lesson in the series, 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for the time to be together today to have have fun, uh, to laugh together, to smile together, to get to meet people, to get to rekindle relationships with people, but Lord, most importantly, to study your word. And it's at this time, Lord, we pray that our minds are ready, our hearts are ready, that we will give energy into what we are doing, and that you will be well pleased with it. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now there's a couple things that we've talked about so far. Number one was, this whole theme is, be ready when he comes. Right Now, I told you out of the gate that this is not one of those things we're going to uh, have time to develop, but I want you to know the Bible says Jesus is coming back. The only question is, how will He find you if He were to come back right now? And that's a challenging statement, because quite honestly, if you're not ready, we just sang a bunch of songs about Jesus coming soon, and about being ready, and about surrendering. And the idea is this, sometimes we sing these songs and they just kind of roll off our tongue, because this is what we were used to singing. But if you're not a Christian today, i got to tell you, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you stand opposed to God still. And there's no reason you have to do this. There is no good reason you have to leave today opposed to God. Because what he said in chapter 1 was that the first step to surrender is laying your weapons down. That's what he said. Now, in this process of converting from being on the side that's against God to being on the side that's with God, there's kind of this process that you have to go through. Because like the British soldiers, you could either surrender, or you can surrender, but not want to fight on behalf of the Continental Army. In other words, you can surrender to God, but never pick up His cause and advance His purpose. 
And we talked about what the purpose of God is in chapter 2. And the purpose of God, I'm going to see who listened well, was the salvation of what? Of whom? People. Salvation of people. Why do you think Jesus came to die on the cross? Because he got bored one day? No. Because God wants you to be with him. He wants you in eternity. You see, the purpose of God is the salvation of mankind. And what the Bible says is that we, as we surrender, we pick up that purpose in our talk, and where else? In our walk. Because what you do and what you say can either turn people to God, or it can bring blasphemy to His name. There is no neutral, right? So in this process of surrender, you've got to decide which team you're on, which side you're on. And what's interesting is that in order for somebody to actually go from one side to the next, it takes a lot. It takes a lot. And that's why I want to introduce you to this guy. I don't expect your history books to have told you about Martin James Monty. But Martin James Monty was one of the few individuals, if not the only individual in World War II, that actually switched sides from America, joined Germany, and fought against America. You notice that he uh, looks like he's just an average young man. As a matter of fact, you can see the statistics. Born in St. Louis, Missouri. But you see, what happened was, you'll notice there's a picture of a Catholic priest in the blue box below him. And that Catholic priest, he actually had a radio program that had helped to stir up Martin James Monty's thought process. And it wasn't only Martin, uh, Martin's thought process. He had a huge following in that time period, so much so that the Catholic Church, they shut him down. They tried to take him off the air, and eventually they would take him off the air because what happened was Charles Edward Coughlin, or Coughlin, yeah, Coughlin he had become convinced that communism was the way to go. He had become convinced that socialism was the way to go. And the problem was, before uh, Martin James Monty entered into the, uh, the military, he went and met with that Catholic priest. And that Catholic priest had convinced him, not just through the radio program, but in person, that he was actually needing to fight for or, or for the enemy. And here's why. Because he had believed that America had misidentified the enemy. He would even go on to say, and of course he was in jail in the 1960s. They let him out of jail after serving a, 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 a period of time. And he was only re-arrested again before he would eventually die in jail. But the deal was this. He had been convinced that Germany wasn't the real enemy. That Russia was the real enemy. And of course, young people, I don't expect you to know your World War II history. But here's the deal. In order to fight against Russia, he had to join Germany. So what he did, because Russia and America were uh, trying to fight on some of the same fronts, I guess, there. But either way, the idea was this. He actually left Italy in a plane because he was commissioned and allowed to fly airplanes. There was a plane that was there being recommissioned, being uh, repaired. He got on a plane in southern Italy. He flew to northern Italy, landed at a base that the Germans were holding. He surrendered to the Germans. He would stay in their POW camp for a number of years until he was proven that he really was for their side. And an American citizen was given a Nazi Germany uniform. He put it on. He worked in their propaganda department until he would surrender to the Americans in 1945. Now, the reason I tell you all of that is not because I want you to lift him up in this lesson. But the reason I tell you that is because I want you to ask yourself, what is it that has to happen in the life of someone where they go from fighting against the side to fighting on the side? And the answer that this brings out is you've got to be convinced of the purpose and the pursuit of the side you're fighting for. And young people, let me tell you something. Adults, I challenge you with this one too. Is it possible that some of us are still sitting back in our walk with the Lord because we haven't become convinced that His purpose is worth our life and His pursuits are worth our life? 
You see, because what I offer to you is this. When you believe in the cause, you will give your life for the cause. If you're holding back on the cause, it's because you value something more than you value the cause. That's what made fighting against Japan so, so scary. Because their concept of kamikaze pilots were the ideas of they believed in their call so much that when their bullets ran out in their airplanes, they would crash their airplane into your, your, uh, your carrier, your ship. Because they believed that it was an honor to die for the cause. I wish we had uh, some of that within the church today. Because it seems like maybe we've become too, too comfortable. But what I want you to understand is this idea of switching sides. The guy in the military wasn't the only one who ever did that. You've heard of Saul, whose name became Paul, right? Well, he was probably the guy that if I'm going to look in the Bible and say who switched sides, it would be the Apostle Paul. Because as the text would bring out, he was an individual that would tell you in Philippians chapter 3 as he is a, a dealing with individuals who are trying to put all their trust and all of their efforts into uh, their physical past, he says, hey, wait a second. If we're going to put confidence in the flesh, I can do that more than anybody else here can do that. He would go in to say that he was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. All of these things are significant. In other words, he towed the line of the law. He knew what it was to be a Pharisee. As to zeal, verse 6, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. He believed in it so much that he was willing to drag individuals off to prison. He would get, get letters that would allow him to go in and pull these people who at one time had been Jews, but now they're following this man named Christ. He could pull them out and abuse them. He was the same guy that held the coats of the, man, the men who stoned Stephen, who was a Christian. He was a follower of Jesus. This individual definitely wasn't just passive. He was on strong, stout on one side. And something changed. You see, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9, he would even say, for I'm the, le the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13, for you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God. Now look, young people, this is about how do you change. This is about a change. This isn't about when Jesus comes back, is he going to find me sitting in the right pew? Is He going to find me singing the right songs? Is He going to find me taking the right Lord's Supper? Is He going to find me holding my Bible in my hand? All of those things are good. They're not bad, but I need you to hear me. When Jesus comes back, He needs to know and find that we are surrendered people. Not just surrendered in the sense of, hey, I'm going to obey the gospel so I get something out of it, but surrendered in the sense of, I have been actively pursuing the cause of Christ in this world. That's what He wants to find. The question is, how, how does he get there? How do we get there is what I mean. How do we go from one to the other? And what I want you to do, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, young people, i got to tell you something. One of the easiest things to do in the afternoon at youth rallies is your sugar's down, right? And you're listening to, you're getting comfortable in your chairs. Here's the best way that I know to keep you engaged. You open your Bibles, you open your phone app, you take notes. Because if you don't purpose, it's going to be real easy to get distracted, okay? So here's what I want us to do. The question is, how do you go from one to the other? How do I go from one side to the other side? And where I want us to start is actually 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. I want us to look at 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 18, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 1, and 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7. And here's why, because there's something common in all of these. If you have your Bibles out, I want you to see this. If you don't have your Bibles out, I want you to listen. The Bible says in chapter 2, verse 13, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. If I go down to verse 18, there's another common word. I want you to listen to this common word. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. If I drop down to chapter 3, verse 1, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. And if I go over to chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, you husbands, in the same way, 
Live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, at least in three of those verses, there is one word that kept showing up. Now, it may have changed a little bit, but the core basis of that word, did anybody pick up on that? Chapter 13, or chapter 2, verse 13, 18, and 3, 1. Did anybody see that one word? Submission. 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 Young people, let me ask you a question. What is submission? Yes. Like surrender. Yeah, like surrender. Yes, sir. To give up control. What do you think? Submission. Do what? Give yourself over to. Literally, the word has to do with all of those to an extent, but it it really is this concept of you free willingly, by your decision, place yourself underneath someone else. It's not an oppression. Oppression is different than submission. Because here, here's the way it works. Submission involves my choice. Oppression involves somebody else's choice, right? I am the one who chooses to submit versus somebody else making me go underneath their command, right? So when the text says, submit to the governing authorities, servants submit to your masters, even the unreasonable ones, wives submit to your husbands, and then it says, you husbands in a like manner live with your wives. What the Bible is saying that is crucial to this whole concept is that if we are going to surrender to the pursuits of God, then we must choose to place ourselves under His authority. Now, I know that sounds weird, right? Almost like a redundant, that means a repetitive phrase, young people, where we're saying, okay, I'm going to lay down my arms, I'm going to consider the pursuits of God, which is the salvation of souls, but now you're telling me I've got to purposely, willfully, by my choice, put myself under His authority to pursue His pursuits. And that's absolutely right. Because otherwise, you're called enslaved people. Right? If I, if I, if I make you do it, because I threaten you, or I make you do it because I, I have conquered you, then the idea is you may do it because you don't want your head cut off, right? In the military sense. But you're not doing it because you want to do it. And here's the way it works with God. He wants you to want to pursue His pursuits. That's what it means to surrender. Submission is a key word in this text. And it's not only dealing with authorities, it's not only dealing with servants, those who are unreasonable, but as the example that is given, Jesus Christ is the one who actually submitted. And He did so up in chapter 2, verse 23, and while being reviled, He did not revile in return. While suffering, He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting Himself to Him who judges righteously. In other words, how are you going to submit to this process? in the midst of suffering, you're going to do it the same way Jesus did it. And Jesus put Himself in the hand of the Father. And He said, not my will be done, but yours. I think it's quite interesting that the way this flows, and of course, obviously, I don't think that you're in the season for marriage. I've already kind of made that joke. But it's really true. But if I'm going to be honest with the text, young people, this is a valuable thing to learn. And that is this, that even in your life here and your relationships here, you are still either on God's side or you're not on God's side. You are either pursuing His pursuits, you're surrendered to His pursuits, or you're not surrendered to His pursuits. And one of those areas in chapter 3 that it addresses is the subject of marriage. You see, sometimes we get this fanciful idea that marriage is all about love and marriage is all about the way the other person makes you feel and it's always about whether or not I get, you know, kind of my dreams come true. What I want you to hear is this. There were some individuals in this group of people right here that their marriages were hurting. They were struggling. And the reason they were struggling, oftentimes it's believed by those who look into the text deeper, it's because Christianity was not popular. And if you were going to live as a Christian, but your spouse was not a believer, your spouse was not a Christian, there could be some serious hardships that took place as paganism was steeped in that culture. It was deep in that culture. 
persecution was alive. And you could imagine one spouse who was married to a Christian maybe looking at that situation going, this is crazy. I cannot believe you are following a belief of a man who said he was going to be raised from the dead and now his tomb is empty and you're willing to put our family through this? See, you and I, we have it so much different. Now, I don't know all your situations. I do know some people today who are married, but they are not equally yoked with their spouse. In other words, their spouse is not a Christian, but they are. And that causes a lot of hardship in the home. So young people, please hear me. It really does matter who you marry. And if it matters who you marry, let me go ahead and throw this one out. You're going to marry someone you date. It matters who you date. If you wouldn't marry her, don't date her. If you're not going to marry him, don't date him. Why? You're like, well, because he makes me feel butterflies. Eat, eat some food that gives you indigestion. It'll feel the same. You don't understand. I just want to be loved. Well, Find somebody in the church or, or, you know, grandparent figure and say, hey, I just want to be loved. They'll love on you. They will take you to dinner. They will give you birthday presents. They will love. You're like, no, it's not the same, Joe. I know it's not the same. But here's what I do know. When your season of life comes for you to seriously start looking at the opposite sex for marriage, you look for people who are running to Jesus and in relationships with Jesus. That's who you pay attention to. Why does that matter? It matters because within the marriage relationship, the well-being of the home is brought about in the pursuits of God. And here's why. Because through your marriage, God's pursuits are still being accomplished when you have a surrendered approach in life. And by that, I mean this. And of course, you can see there on the screen, I've already mentioned chapter 1, um, chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 7. But I think it's quite interesting that when you really get down in here, the core of what's going on is that the spouse will still be one. Look at chapter 3, verse 1, or listen. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. In other words, changed people, people who have surrendered to Jesus, people who are on the side of God, changed people live changed lives, even in marriage. Because ultimately, you realize real quick, it's not about your happiness. You're like, yes, it is. I'm not saying you're not going to be happy. I'm saying it's not about your happiness. You will be happy when you are married to an individual who loves Jesus more than they love you. But it's not about your happiness. It's about His glory. So here's the deal. Why do I respond in my marriage the way that I do? I respond in my marriage because I love Jesus. Why does Erin respond in our marriage the way that she does? Because she loves Jesus. At least that's, we better be on that page, right? Because as difficult as this is from time to time, you know, maybe I will say things I shouldn't say and not think before I say them, right? Like, um, you don't cook as good as, you know, never mind, I don't say that, right? I don't, I don't say that. I've said some things growing up, you know, in our marriage that I've had to, have help with, and she's helped me. But the truth is this, the truth is this, the reality, this is about God. Even in my marriage, it's about God. And in this passage, it's about winning the husband. But look over at chapter 3, verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that, why? So that your prayers will not be hindered. Men, we've got to realize this. Young men, you need to hear this right now. There are very few places in the Scripture that talk about what might hinder prayers. One of those passages has to do with the way you treat your future wife. That's just what it is. And we better be aware of that. The idea is we need to come to understand. But why? Because there is a spiritual principle at play. Number two, I want you to understand that in marriage, still God pursues souls. Your marriages in the future are going to be either help God's cause or they're going to hurt God's cause. You've got to decide what kind of marriage you're going to have, right? So when I do this, I look at a passage of Scripture as it flows down to verse 8 of First Peter chapter. The idea of how do I live in an environment where suffering is my reality 
And the deal is, I don't wait on everybody else to get their act in order. I get my act in order. Right? Oftentimes when there are problems, you know what we do, young people? We point fingers. When there are problems, we point fingers. And you know what the Bible does? When it talks about how you're going to have unity, how you're going to have this idea of what God, a marriage that God's going to accomplish His will, He tells you to point inwardly. And He asks the question, are you the one who's harmonious? Are you the one who's sympathetic? Are you the one who's brotherly? Are you the one who's kind-hearted? And are you the one who's humble in spirit? Because here's what I've learned. If I'm going to pursue the purposes of God, the pursuits of God, I can't control other people. I can't, I can't, I, I, I might can, you know, I, and I use this illustration, please understand. I can control my children if I threaten them enough, right? I'm going to take this away. You know, I grew up in the days of whoopings, and I know that's very unpolitically, not politically correct today, but here's the deal. There's a lot of control that goes on with whoopings, right? Because you want to avoid any discomfort. But just because I control their behavior doesn't mean I reach their heart. Right? My, my, my goal is not their behavior, it's their heart. Because you get their heart, they'll have their behavior. If you get their behavior, it's only temporary. The question is, what are they going to be and do when they're out of your house? Go for their heart, parents. Young people, let God have your heart, not just your external behaviors. Now here's the deal though, when you become what you're supposed to be internally, harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, that's hard because at the core we want to point fingers. It's your fault, your fault, your fault. We'll be right when you're right. We'll be right, we'll get better when you're better. And the Bible says you can't control them. You make sure you are who you're supposed to be. The second thing I want to give you and then I'm going to let the lesson be yours is this idea of I pursue God and the pursuits of God even in my sufferings. The word suffering in 1 Peter is found, I believe it's 17 times. It's third only to the word God and only to the word Jesus. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the deal is this. He's telling the Christians, you're going to have hard times. As a matter of fact, he's told them that the hard times that they're going to have, it's not always because they did something wrong. Can you imagine suffering for wrongdoing? You say, well, Joe, I broke the law, therefore I had to go to jail. Joe, I got in trouble at school, therefore I had to go to detention. That's understandable, right? When you do things that are wrong and you pay the cost for doing things that are wrong, that is understandable. But when you do things that were right and you suffer for that, that's hard to swallow. And there are going to be people here who suffer for doing what's right. Standing up for God, and here's what I wrote in my notes. As children of God, when you stand up for Him, you will stand out from the crowd. That's the way it works. When you stand up, you will stand out. And I tell you this, there are hardships that occur, but you and I need to understand. Luke chapter 23, verse 41, even a thief on the cross understood this principle with Jesus. When He said, and we indeed are suffering justly, but we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. You think for one moment that we're the only ones who suffer for doing what's right? We need to take our eyes off of us and put them back on Jesus. Because that's exactly what happened to him. And again, I will go back to that same passage. How did he do it? Chapter 2, verse 23. He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. In other words, he kept saying, okay, God, if this is your, what you want, then this is what I'm going to do. Okay, God, if this is what you want, this is what I'm going to do. If I've got to endure this, then this is what I'm going to endure. Because it's not about me, it's about you. It's about your purpose and your pursuits, which is the salvation of mankind. And if Jesus did that, guess what? You and I can do the same. But here's my question, why? Why would God allow such? And I want to show you these two. Because here's what the text says ultimately. Number one, chapter 3, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Suffer for the sake of righteousness. I thought, Joe, you're telling me that if I surrender to God, everything's going to be okay. And I want you to hear me say something, young people. You surrender to God, everything's going to be okay in eternity. You could lose your life here in this world. 
You could have people not invite you to certain events. You could lose jobs. That's where you've got to decide, am I for him or am I against him? Am I really surrendered or am I sort of surrendered? Which ultimately at the end of the day I call that a ceasefire. Have I only asked God for a ceasefire or have I laid my weapons down? You know, because it's not a surrender if I'm still holding on to a weapon, right? Just in case I need to use it against him. No. Surrender means I laid it all down. And you know what? When you're laying it down and you're trying to decide if I'm going to pick up a weapon and advance his cause, you've got to ask yourself, is it worth it? And I need to be real with you. You could suffer and you will suffer in this life. There will be relationships that will probably not be had. There will be times that you cry because you've got to decide, am I for him or am I against him? And if you're for him, that means that you're going to suffer for righteousness. Second to that, and I've got to be real with you, young people, listen, you want to know Joe Wells. This is probably one of the most difficult passages in all of 1 Peter that I have to stomach because it's hard for me to stomach it because I don't necessarily like all the answers. But it is possible that God will will for you to suffer. You say, no, God only wants what's good for me. Okay. You ever heard your parents say, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you? You're like, that was a lie of parenthood. Until you became a parent, right? And then you began to realize real quick, discipline is actually a sign of love if it's done correctly. It's painful for the moment, but it's to my benefit. I want you to really listen to this verse. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. The reason this passage hurts is because in my mind, yeah, I struggle to see God as a God who says, okay, Joe, I'm going to let you suffer. As a matter of fact, I'm not just going to let you suffer. It's going to be my will that you suffer. Because in the back of my mind, I'm like, God, why would you do that? Why won't you just rescue me from my suffering? And I've got to take you all the way back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Because in this particular passage, he deals with that subject when he talks about passing through the fires. He says, verse 6 of chapter 1, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation. You ever seen, I've, I've never ored precious metal. But one of the ways, when they pull gold out of the ground, one of the ways they purify it is they send it through the fire. And they send it through the fire because, or they crush it, right? They've got high hydraulic presses that are just crushing it, and then they send it through the fire. And the reason they do that is because they're trying to burn off the impurities. But here's what they get when the gold comes out of the fire. The goldsmith smith will look at the gold, and he may say, you know what, you've got to go back through the fire again because there's more dross, more impurities that didn't burn off. And so he'll send it back through. And on this side of the fire, he may look at it and go, mm, not yet, not done yet. And then he'll say, hey, you know what the goldsmith is looking for? And I thought this was quite interesting. It was brought to light not too long ago. He's looking at the gold, and guess what he wants to see? Somebody tell me what he wants to see. He wants to see purity, but what's he really want to see? When he looks at the gold, he wants to see his own reflection. That's what a goldsmith looks for where he says, finally the gold is ready. And guess what God says? I'm going to send you through the fire because you're not done yet. And you go through the fire, you're like, whoo, God, thanks for seeing me through that. And he goes, Joe, I'm going to send you through the fire again because you're not done yet. And you're like, God, come on, do you really have to do that? Yep, I really got to do that. Send it through. And he looks at it and he goes, Joe, I got to tell you something. Not yet. And so he sends me back through. And I'm like, God, if you really love me, you would quit doing this. And God says, Joe, because I love you, this is why I do this. And he sends me through the fire of persecution and suffering again. And finally, at some point in time, I don't know when that is because I'm still in process. He looks at the gold. He looks at your life and he says, finally, I see the image that I was looking for. And it's not me. He's looking for him in you. 
You don't want to know what God wants to find when Jesus comes back? He wants to find his reflection in you. And sometimes that means it's going to hurt. And that's why that passage I struggle with. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, no, I'll never suffer. Lord, if I keep preaching your word, none of my children will ever have cancer. Lord, if I keep preaching your word, I'll never lose a job of preaching. Lord, if I keep preaching your word, I'll never have any difficulties. And that's, he never promised any of that. Because what he's interested in is not just have you laid your weapon down. He's wanting to know, are you really his? And being really his means this. You've surrendered to his pursuits in every area of your life. That's chapter 3. Let's have a word of prayer. And then I want you all to go to discuss that. And probably a whole lot more that I didn't even point out in that text. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you, and we just ask that as we go through our times of difficulties in this life for, uh, for being your people, either by persecution we receive from that or our false indication that as long as we're your people, we won't have any problems. Lord, I pray that you will help change us to understand that your son suffered and that we are not better than your son. But Lord, help us not intellectually just to have that discussion. Help us to really understand that. And I pray through those fires, Lord, that you would pull us through. I pray that our faith would not waver. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us as you shape us, as you get rid of that dross. Lord, help us to re retain our relationship with you through all of that. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be your people. Help us to be brave enough to advance your cause, no matter what it costs us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.